you like. The slides also carry a lot of sweet memories of many years of his journey in the research career. Let us all see and hear again from Tom Blendel. I'm sure that this will inspire our student community towards taking up research related career. Thank you very much, Professor Sir Tom Blendel for agreeing for today's talk. Over to you, sir. Uh, we are going to be <laughs> very much blessed now with this particular lecture of yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I welcome yes. everyone to this particular program. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Um, first, I must apologize for the problems uh, that we had last week. And it's uh, extremely kind of you to invite me back to give this talk which is, of course, uh, celebrating the centenary of insulin's discovery. Uh, it, it's um, uh, going to be a story uh, in which I played a part in only half of the century, <laughs> but still uh, five decades. Uh, and I'm going to discuss the major steps uh, in this story which of course uh, started with um, uh, just a minute. I'm started with uh, insulin uh, and insulin being discovered as uh, crystals in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. It was surprising that there were crystals, very tiny crystals in the granules, and uh, of course that meant that it was fairly easy then to produce crystals of a larger size uh, for uh, treatment of patients when uh, it was realized uh, that it could be used in diabetes. So this was now over 20 years, uh, over 100 years ago uh, that this was discovered, but things moved also in 1921, exactly 100 years ago. But it was quite a time uh, later, in fact, in 1934, that uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, having been uh, working with the famous J.D. Bernal, who influenced all our lives, um, got interested in X-ray diffraction. She joined uh, J.D. Bernal in 1932. I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a moment. And then in 1934, moved back to Oxford. Uh, so the original diffraction was taken in Cambridge, where I am now. Uh, she went back to Oxford, which is the place she still was when I joined her later. Again, I'll tell you uh, about that. And she wondered what she could do now that diffraction of uh, crystals had been demonstrated and written up in nature. And she realized that there were these insulin crystals already available from Beecham's, uh, which were used to treat uh, diabetics. And so she tried to uh, put them in an X-ray beam and got the kind of pattern uh, that I'm showing you here. But um, that was 1934. And that was Dorothy Hodgkin um, in 1934. She continued to do uh, a lot of work uh, on insulin, but it proved to be very challenging. And she worked on other molecules. And in 1964, she was given the Nobel Prize, but not for insulin. So 30 years after she started, nobody had been able to solve the structure of insulin. So I'll tell you how I was lucky to be there. In, I was there the day she got the Nobel Prize in 1964, but it took us another five years, part of which I spent doing work on uh, learning crystallography, uh, but then participating in the structure uh, of insulin. And I'll tell you about that. Once we had the structure of insulin, and I wrote a book on uh, protein crystallography, uh, the HIV protease um, became a target because HIV AIDS became a major challenge for everybody in the world. And I was able 
to participate in that in uh, the 1980s uh, and um, work on designing new AIDS antivirals. And I realized that it could be used, structural biology, uh, for many different purposes to understand key targets in drug discovery. And that's, of course, been the case with the SARS COVID 2 uh, proteome, which we published an analysis of a year ago, and many of us have been working on since the pandemic uh, arose. I'll say a little bit about that, but I also want to talk about the revolutionary changes that have occurred in uh, the way that we can look at proteins. And so I'll talk about cryo EM. And that has been a major revolution in my life. Uh, this is a huge multi-protein system, DNA PK, that I'll tell you about, uh, that I couldn't possibly have done with x-rays because we never could get crystals of such a complex, flexible system. But with cryo-EM, you can choose particles which are uh, similar and make an analysis. So I'll tell you about that resolution revolution in cryo-EM, and then I'll discuss how all of this can be applied to drug discovery. So that's an outline of my talk, but I should go back a uh, hundred years uh, to start. And let me just say, I'm very pleased to be giving a talk at your university in Mysore, um, but I'm going to go uh, uh, back I'll uh, say a little bit when uh, I'm going of my own connections with um, India over five decades. Uh, the first person who really um, I got to know was Siv Ramasation. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, would have heard of him. He um, came to Oxford in 1964 and I was there and got talking to him about India. And then uh, he uh, encouraged Vijayan, Professor uh, M. Vijayan, who became president of your academy. And he joined the insulin group just after I did. And, and then, of course, many others came later, Sardamini and Srinivasan and uh, others from Bangalore in particular, but I've had a long uh, history of collaboration over five decades um, with India and visited many times, even visited Mysore, of course. Um, so let me go back a uh, uh, 100 years, because it's about 100 years. And um, of course, the major initiative in understanding insulin and its relationship to diabetes came from Banting and Best, who were in uh, Toronto, and uh, they um, began to understand that insulin came from the pancreas, from the beta cell, and um, later work allowed them to see the islets of Langerhans where uh, you could see insulin. And of course, that's where insulin is stored in a crystalline, microcrystalline form. And, and the advantage of having insulin in microcrystalline form is first, it's stable in the granules. And secondly, when it's released into the circulation, it dissolves slowly. And therefore, the insulin is available over quite a long period. And of course, using insulin microcrystals and that in treatment of diabetics means that the insulin is slowly becoming available and it becomes a very useful way of maintaining um, treatment, not every minute, but every day. And so this is the story, the realization. Here's a picture of the insulin granules and you'll see that they are microcrystals. And in this, um, uh, pattern cryo -EM, you can see the lines of the molecules and of course here are the crystals and you can see the symmetry of the crystals is reflecting the 3-2 symmetry 
uh, the threefold symmetry and the twofold perpendicular to it um, in the insulin molecule. So this is a hundred years ago, the discovery of insulin. And what I'm going to talk about is not just insulin, um, but what has happened in the methodology and the advances um, using the techniques that were developed by Dorothy Hodgkin. So let's go back, um, not a hundred years, but um, as you can see, nearly uh, 90 years uh, to Cambridge where I am now. And um, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin left Oxford just briefly uh, to go to work with the great J.D. Bernal. And you see him uh, here on the right um, with Dorothy Hodgkin. And um, he was a great thinker and um, wrote about science in a broader context and, of course, had uh, very left-wing politics. And Dorothy was very impressed. And uh, when Dorothy joined J.D. Bernal's laboratory, um, uh, they uh, got crystals um, from uh, uh, actually Sweden uh, of pepsin, and they brought them back uh, to, uh, 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 to Cambridge. And um, they put the crystals in an X-ray beam and they got no diffraction and they wondered what had happened. And then they thought about it and they realized that they had to keep the crystals of pepsin wet because crystals of pepsin were in a biological environment in a sense, in that they had an aqueous uh, surrounding. And so uh, what happened is that Bernal and Dorothy Hodgkin kept the crystals of pepsin wet um, and they did that by putting them in a capillary and sealing it off, but with a, a little reservoir of, of solvent. And they got a diffraction pattern, as you can see on the bottom, and the first diffraction pattern uh, of a protein. And then they wrote this wonderful letter to Nature, to the editor of Nature, saying, now that a crystalline protein has been made to give X-ray photographs, it's clear that we have a means of checking them and by examining the structure of all crystalline proteins, arriving at more detailed conclusions about protein structure than previous physical or chemical methods have been able to give. So this was Dorothy Hodgkin and J.D. Bernal in 1934. Um, I think what they didn't realize uh, was that it was going to take another 20 years until a protein structure could be solved. Um, and uh, in the meantime, of course, Dorothy Hodgkin worked on many other uh, subjects. Uh, but um, Dorothy looked for crystals after the pepsin experiment and realized that the insulin crystals in 1934 um, would be a good target. And um, uh, she got diffraction patterns, which were published in uh, 1934, I think. And uh, of course, she realized that they were reflecting the crystalline insulin in the pancreas. So 1934, everything looked straightforward, um, but it took uh, another 30 years. And the insulin structure came uh, in around 1964. And what I'm showing here is um, 1964, Dorothy Hodgkin was given the Nobel Prize. In 1964, almost on the same day, uh, so I had nothing to do with it. Um, Dorothy Hodgkin was on television. She was in Africa because her husband was an Africanologist and um, uh, she was given the Nobel Prize for many other structures of biological molecules. But the insulin group, um, which included Guy Dodson, Eleanor Dodson, Margaret Adams, and had a big impact from Siv Ramasation, um, still hadn't solved the structure. So I joined in 19, uh, 
64 the lab, but 67 started working on insulin. Uh, Vijayan came all the way from India in 1968, and Ted Baker and others joined the group. And um, we started in 1964, uh, again, working on the project, uh, which had not been solved for 30 years. Uh, but it was an amazing time. And there you see uh, a picture uh, with uh, Vijayan and myself. I'm hidden behind Vijayan, uh, talking with Thomas Hodgkin about politics, which we were both heavily involved in and enjoying. We were both very left wing. Vijayan, of course, was involved in politics before he came influenced by his uh, father and others. And um, uh, we had lots of discussions with Thomas Hodgkin sitting on the floor, and there is Dorothy Hodgkin standing up there talking to um, one of um, David Phillips's colleagues, uh, Tony North. So I joined in 1964 and joined all these wonderful people. Um, I decided I would do my PhD in a slightly different area to learn the techniques and to learn how to write software in the area. And that's what I did. So I joined eventually the project in um, 1967 full time, although I was in the same lab. And in 1969, we made the breakthrough. Of course, it depended on a lot of work when uh, I had not been there, but I did contribute to the final stages of defining this beautiful uh, zinc insulin hexama. And um, coming from a family that had no scientific roots, but were artists and musicians, the first thing that struck me was how beautiful science could be. So I, I compared the insulin hexama uh, with the Chartres Cathedral window. Uh, so insulin has six subunits, but there are 12 apostles in Christianity, which incidentally I don't follow, but you can see the threefold symmetry in the window that I was familiar with and in the hexama were common. So I realized that science was beautiful. I also realized, of course, that it was useful. And uh, having uh, uh, got the structure of insulin, we could now think about uh, whether we could make it more effective um, than the insulin uh, that is natural, longer lasting, for example. And so I began to think about these aspects and write a lot once we got the structure uh, about uh, the, the biology. We got papers, of course, in Nature on the structure, but um, I also wrote a lot about the biological function. And of course, it was a wonderful environment. You see myself uh, sitting here um, with long hair and um, young at that time. And you see Dorothy Hodgkin, who'd been working on the project for 30 years, uh, still looking beautiful, of course. And uh, at the bottom here, uh, whoops, um, you, you see the um, uh, fun we had in the group. And there is Vijayan being dressed up by my colleague, uh, uh, um, uh, Guy Dodson. So it was a very friendly um, environment that we solved the structure of insulin and celebrated and thought about the biology. But um, I was very political and um, I um, had uh, worked on the issue of race when I was a, a, an undergraduate and became the chair of the biggest race uh, committee, which was called the Joint Action Committee Against Racial Intolerance, and um, realized, of course, in Dorothy's group, we were totally multiracial. So many of my political concerns locally were okay. But in Oxford, we had many problems. Um, and they were partly uh, due to the fact that a motorway was planned to be driven through the city but also because many people came from uh, many countries and started working in the Morris uh, uh, Motors, a press deal 
in Oxford making cars. And of course, they were cheap labor in a sense, as the industry was in the UK was uh, becoming problematic. And so this was the environment. And I stood um, in Oxford with all these beautiful buildings um, as a politician for the council. And uh, my objective was to stop the motorway and to make sure that the traffic through Oxford was minimized and the beautiful buildings and everything were preserved. So in parallel to working on insulin, I was running all of the city planning. I got control of the city um, uh, after being two years on the council. And uh, so I stopped the motorway, pedestrianized the city of uh, center. You can't still drive through Oxford. Um, we made North Oxford a conservation area and we introduced bus lanes. I think we were probably one of the first cities in the world to have this rather progressive policy. So politics, I realized, was very important, um, but I was confused. Um, what should I do? Should I play the music? I was a musician playing in a jazz group in the nights. Um, should I do politics or should I do science? And I decided that I had to go away and escape for a little while. So this journey led me to India. So first I got on a train and I went to Moscow. And then for seven days, I traveled across uh, Siberia. And so this um, was my escape and I arrived in Kavarosk. Kavarosk, how, where did I go from there? I couldn't get into China. China was locked at that time. And so I found a friend, um, a new friend, a Japanese lady called Riko, and she had a plane organized uh, to take people to visit uh, Siberia. The Russians were trying to make friends with the Japanese after a big fight in the 1930s. And so Reiko had taken some of the people who fought in the battle against the Russians, and there were places on the plane. So I managed to get on the plane, and I flew from Russia uh, to, um, uh, in fact, um, Japan. And um, so making this journey, and then I stayed in Japan for some time, uh, trying to learn Japanese, Nihongo Benkyo Shimashita, Muzukashi Des, it's very difficult. And then I traveled down uh, around Asia, couldn't get into China again, got into Taipei, um, and then Hong Kong, and then traveled. Uh, but as I traveled, I listened to music because I was a jazz musician. I discovered in Hong Kong and uh, the beautiful music. Uh, I later saw it in Beijing. And then I traveled on and I reached India for the first time. Uh, first uh, arriving in Calcutta and uh, giving a lecture there, which is very exciting and telling about my journey that I've made. So I'd already been on the journey quite a few months. And then uh, from Calcutta, I went down, ended in Bangalore. This time, the first time, uh, 1972, I hadn't managed to go to Mysore. That came in future uh, visits. But I fell in love with India. And um, of course, I was lucky because Dorothy Hodgkin had many friends, including Siv Ramaseshan and others who'd been students in her lab who were back in India. So I met up with Vijayan and Kalyani and Siv Ramaseshan and met many other Indians in Bangalore where I stayed for some time. Um, so that was my first visit uh, to uh, Bangalore. And um, at that time, I became interested not only in the science, but I started to learn the Vena. So I was in Bangalore for a little while and I managed to um, get a Vena and started taking um, lessons in the Vena. And I carried the Vena all the way back to England. I don't know how I managed to get it on the plane now. And then I found a, a friend, Krishna Raghavendra, 
who gave me lessons. And so I was not only a jazz musician, but I was attempting to play Carnatic music on the Vena. It's beautiful. And um, I find many of my friends who go to India uh, don't realize how beautiful Carnatic music is in the South. Um, and so I often try to introduce them to it. So it's very beautiful. But I had to go back uh, to Oxford. And when I went to Oxford, I wondered what I should do. And Dorothy Hodgkin uh, suggested I went to Sussex. I said, well, what am I going to do, Dorothy? And she said, I'll get you a job. And so um, almost the next day, I got a phone call from Sussex University um, uh, from this man, John Maynard Smith. And I went to Sussex University for three years. I gave up politics. I didn't play music every night and I concentrated. And in three years, I got three papers in Nature. I solved the structure of glucagon that was published in Nature. I, I did some work on understanding the chemistry and the functionality of insulin. And that got published in Nature. And then I did a more uh, extraordinary thing, according to everyone else, I started looking at the sequence of insulin and thinking about its evolution and realized that with the structure, I could understand that some of the changes in insulin between different species were selective, they were Darwinian, and some had occurred uh, randomly. And so I made an analysis of that. And in three years in Sussex, I got my third nature paper in 1975, and that was on Darwinian evolution. And then, to my surprise, I got invited to go to Birkbeck College. Birkbeck College is where J.D. Bernal went, the man I was telling you about, who was the um, inspiration for Dorothy Hodgkin's work. And I went to Birkbeck, and um, I started, um, of course, doing many things. I, uh, joined uh, with um, Louise Johnson, and we wrote the first textbook on protein crystallography. I don't know how I managed that. And um, uh, went on to Bernal's place in Birkbeck College in London University and realized all of the things that I could do in London that I couldn't do in Oxford and Cambridge. And they were, of course, um, not only jazz at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club, but also opera at the English National Opera and the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. So I enjoyed 20 years in London and um, realized while I was there um, that what I'd learned in Dorothy's lab, I was forgetting some things, but I could relearn them. And that is that the insulin we'd been working on came from companies Novo, welcome, Eli Lilly. And I realized that the people I'd met while I was in Dorothy Hodgkin's lab had moved to other subjects than insulin. And almost every large pharmaceutical company had somebody I knew in. So I started thinking about how I could collaborate and do something useful with the work I've been doing, uh, working on pepsin, uh, on renin, which is um, lowering blood pressure. And I'll tell you in a moment on HIV. So that's what I did for some years. Uh, while I was in Birkbeck, I looked at the pepsin, realized and worked out the structure by modeling first and then by X-ray crystallography, the structure of renin, which controls blood pressure. And then I realized I could use that by looking at the binding sites on the right-hand side and the hydrogen bonding system to design new inhibitors of insulin and therefore have something that might control blood pressure. And that was what I was doing in uh, 1978. I wrote a paper on evolution of pepsin while I was doing it and realized that here on the left is pepsin and renin, they look very similar. Um, and I suddenly realized that the two halves were rather similar. And 
I predicted there will be a molecule which had symmetry like this. And I wrote it up in Nature, so it's not just me dreaming about it. It was all written down in 1978. And I look for the molecule on the right-hand side. Does it still exist, I asked myself. And then it took me six years to find it. But what did I find? I found HIV protease in the HIV um, sequence, genome sequence that became available in the early 80s. And I suddenly realized that in that genome of HIV was a molecule similar to the protease. And so I was very quickly able to um, uh, realize that if I could find and define the structure of the HIV polyprotein, which had the protease in it, uh, and block that, I would then block the maturation of the HIV, and I had an anti-HIV uh, um, antiviral. So uh, I started working on that, and um, after a few years, I defined the structure of the HIV protease, but I knew what it was already because I recognized the pattern that I predicted in Nature in 78, but I decided that I better do the structure because people said I was speculating too much. So uh, 1989, uh, along and parallel with uh, a good friend, Alex Vladava, that I'd already worked with, we both published in Nature the structure of the HIV protease and uh, began to think about how we could make new HIV antivirals. So this got me really involved in drug discovery. And I realized that the other thing I had to understand was how you got resistance to new drugs. So the next work that I did over the last, well, three decades or so has really been in two parts. First, looking at the biological space, what is the relationship between the gene sequence, the protein sequence, and the protein structure? And then secondly, understanding the chemical space, uh, the place where the natural substrate would bind or where I could put drugs um, or design drugs for. And so I began to plan my work with two halves. First, basic science, defining the biological space, and then uh, the uh, applied side of understanding how to get new uh, molecules that bound. So what did I do in the biological space? Well, I'll just give you an example of how that's developed. Um, I got very involved, of course, with um, targets in cancer, and this is uh, DNA repair, and cancer cells uh, actually um, uh, really uh, have these DNA molecules that they um, uh, exploit. But you can see in DNA repair, um, uh, you could, if you blocked the DNA repair, you could block and kill the cancer cell. Of course, it's it would also affect other cells, but you could uh, perhaps target the tumor. So the cancer um, DNA repair that I was interested in was in what's called non-homologous uh, end joining, where you have the broken ends of double-strand DNA. You actually um, uh, put them together with a molecule called uh, Artemis uh, linking, and then uh, you bring them together. You in, the, in this process, you cleave the ends and tidy them up, and then you make a join. So non-homologous end joining is really a fix it. You just cleave the ends and make them uh, uh, both uh, without any overhangs, and then you join them together. And that's in all of your bodies, a major quick repair. So I started to work on that, and I realized there were lots of molecules in it, and I would need lots of techniques. So I use small angle x-ray scattering. I use computer uh, analysis of the genes. I then use x-rays. Um, and in 2010, got the structure of this huge 
protein molecule called DNAPK, um, which has 4,000 amino acids. Eventually, in 2017, I got that to 4.3 angstrom resolution, but still not high resolution. And it took the other resolution revolution of cryo-EM to get a high resolution structure, which we published um, in 2017. And we use other techniques like nanospray and mass spec. So this um, was the structure we were involved in. And, and this was the resolution revolution in cryo-EM. And the most exciting thing that's happened in structural biology uh, over the last um, few years is the resolution revolution using the cryo-EM. So this is how, after working for nearly 20 years on the X-ray structure, we could produce a structure of this very complex molecule at 2.8 angstrom resolution um, uh, very quickly. And this we published in 2020, and then we went on to uh, look at complexes and highly uh, complicated domain interactions that occur in this multi-protein system. And this is the cryo-EM of a complex. Um, and you can see three of my very bright people here, Amanda Chaplin, Steve Hardwick, Antonia Kefala. Um, you can see that's the structure we define by cryo-EM of this very critical complex. I would have never got this crystallized, but it has uh, a lot of components, as you can see, and we could envisage the whole thing um, uh, in a very beautiful way. So uh, this is just uh, still being published in molecular cell, um, but we publish uh, another structure in nature, structural biology. So that's the experimental side of exploring biological space. But the real problem is, um, how do you get uh, structures for all the gene products? And so in my lab, we spent a lot of time, some of you may have used our software, developing software over the years. And um, Modeler is the software that has been most used. Actually, it's got 13,000 citations now, not 12,000. And uh, that was written by uh, uh, Andre Shelley and myself, uh, me with the ideas and Andre uh, with better ideas and developing the software. And then we wrote another piece of software called Fugue. So what it meant is that we could go through the genome, find homologs with known structures, and then build them automatically. And I think this was the first very quick and effective method by satisfaction of spatial re restraints. We'd already written other types of software, uh, but this one was the most effective. And so what we've done is to go through different genomes like tuberculosis, and we can build around 70%, 80% of the sequence uh, um, proteins um, in three dimensions. And we've done that for mycobacterium tuberculosis. I realized that two of my ex-colleagues, Srinivasan and Sadamini in Bangalore, uh, were doing the same thing. They've been working in my lab, so we were good friends. So we decided we would publish uh, this work uh, together. You see the reference uh, down there with Sadamini and Srinivasan's um, pictures and names in red. So we continue to collaborate with our Indian colleagues and um, we developed other databases. This one was Mabellini for M. obsessus. This is a related mycobacterium, which infects cystic fibrosis patients. And we did the same thing for this. So, and then the most recent thing that we've done is with leprosy. Leprosy is 90% similar to um, tuberculosis genome. And of course, as you know, it's uh, a disease that is quite prevalent in India, in parts of Africa, and in Brazil, in South America. And um, 200,000 people a year um, are getting this disease fatally. And we decided to do genome analysis. And uh, 
this man, another India, uh, Sandeep Chaitanya, uh, came and joined my lab. And we now have the leprosy uh, research center of the American leprosy mission in my lab and working on these. But we worked out a model for the proteome using our software. And of course, we worked out a SARS-CoV-2 uh, model for the proteome. I'm not going to go through all of that, but we can use it for uh, drug discovery and understanding mutations. And um, of course, the most recent thing that's happened in our SARS-CoV-2 work is that after working on trying to get the X-ray structure of the NSP15 protein, we suddenly got the cryo-EM structure at um, 2.4 angstrom resolution. And you see there's another Indian there, Sherine Thomas. She's from Kerala. Um, and um, uh, she and she can Yang uh, from uh, China solved the cryo-EM structure at very high resolution. So Indians uh, continue to make contributions, but we have not only experimental work, but alongside cryo-EM, the other revolution has been in artificial intelligence. And so we've written a lot of software. I haven't time to go through that, but when Arian Jamas, is one of the people who are probably one of the brightest um, who's been developing deep learning methods for understanding protein-protein interactions, protein ligand, and many other interactions. So we're doing machine learning, we're doing cryo-EM. These are the two major things. And we've also done a lot of analysis with um, uh, on cancer and the cancer gene census, just publishing uh, now uh, the uh, structures of the 800 gene products that um, uh, really cause cancer. They're very complicated, multi-protein, multi-domain, and it's taken us quite a time to get this paper sorted, but it's now available. So that was uh, defining biological space. What do we do with chemical space? Well, what we do is a method which um, we thought about in my lab, we spent a year in the lab uh, uh, developing it, um, but it really came from another Indian, Haran Jyoti, who had been in my lab doing his PhD in the 80s, but was then working in Glaxo Welcome. And he had the idea of fragment-based discovery. So fragment-based discovery is, Let's not just work on drug-like molecules, which have 500 molecular weight, but let's make, take tiny molecules because we can explore chemical space with less than a thousand of those rather than 20 million or something of larger molecules. So this is fragment-based methods, which uh, we developed in our lab briefly. And then with Haran Jyoti, we formed Aztecs. And so the translational part started, you see, with just a few people, but very soon I got a lot of funding and we uh, moved uh, to get 80 employees and moved them up to the science park with Haran Jyoti taking all the risks and being chief executive, but myself chairing the um, uh, advisory board um, and being very much involved as a board member. So this company, we built a large lab in Cambridge outside the university. And uh, over the past um, years, we've got uh, many candidate drugs and um, uh, we realized we were spending a lot of money and suddenly we got an offer for $886 million for our little company that I formed with two people in the lab. And, um, uh, but I kept involved with it. So it's now owned by a Japanese company, a very good one, Otsuka, who kept me involved. And uh, we had our first drug for breast cancer on the market and approved in 2017. And then another one 
for metastatic urethral carcinoma in 2019. And we've got many other cancer drugs now going on the market. But this one, the ribocyclib for uh, developed with Novartis, you have to collaborate with somebody because the clinical trials are so expensive, um, even for a, a company like ours. So um, that one is selling for half a billion dollars a year, that one drug half a billion dollars a year. So uh, we're doing useful things with our methodology, uh, but also some people, not us, are making money out of it. So uh, the challenges for academia continue, even though the progress for new drugs is probably best made in small companies and, um, and possibly large ones. But we've also uh, focused on using these techniques in neglected diseases. So we've worked on tuberculosis. This came out of a visit um, from uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates that I got to know, and we had lots of discussions with, uh, but I realized that tuberculosis was very important, and um, particularly in Southern Africa. And that was very important to me because, um, in fact, my family, my wife's family, comes from Zimbabwe, which is just north of South Africa. And uh, one of our relatives had died of tuberculosis, and it was a challenge for Zimbabwe and South Africa. And Bill Gates, uh, from talking with him, knew I had these connections, and uh, we discussed uh, really what we could do for tuberculosis. And so Bill Gates really wanted to do something uh, in a few days, but I think he realized that it would take a bit longer. Here's the inspiration. In the center there on the left is my wife, my two daughters, um, and, and there um, in, in my great uh, uh, grand um, uh, nephew and niece um, uh, in Africa. My two daughters, of course, have been brought up uh, with my wife and, uh, and myself in UK. Um, uh, this one went to Oxford, got a first. This one went to London School of Economics and got a first. Um, um, this one on the right is a medical doctor, and so is her partner. And this one is working in finance in Annan Overy. But they came, and I still think of them very much connected with beautiful parts of Africa. But we started working on tuberculosis with a feeling that it was something that would affect our family members. We looked at first line drugs, we looked at second line drugs. We began to think of how we could use the fragment screening that we use for cancer um, in uh, drug discovery for tuberculosis. Um, here was one of my first teams on tuberculosis. You see Sachin Saradi, Indian, Vito Mendes, he's from Portugal, Bridget Bannerman from Nigeria, and um, here's Pooja Gupta. You see, as usual, t some of my t members, in this case, half of the members working on this are from India. We have very good collaborations and fantastic science. So this is what Sachin uh, developed, lots of biophysical methods to screen the fragments. And then we took those and we did uh, x-ray structures, we did thermal uh, methods, ITC, to look at the thermodynamics of the binding and surface plasma resonance to look at the kinetics. We got new structures from uh, these uh, screening for tuberculosis in our academic lab. And then what happened is I got a call from Bill Gates. Bill wanted to come on his own, he didn't want me to tell anyone else, but you can see as uh, we laid him up the gates, this is my uh, co-founder of Aztecs, uh, but in our academic lab, up the steps of the building where I work now, 
And you can see already a photographer had discovered that Bill Gates is coming. I've never quite worked out how that was. Uh, we got Bill Gates into our lab. I made him put a lab coat on and he visited and he talked to each one of my group. And I told them they were to tell him first two things. One, which country and which language they had. And we had 30 different languages in my group. And, and then which discipline they came from. And we had mathematicians, computer scientists, physicists, biologists, and chemists, of course, um, in the group. And then you can see Bill sat down with some of my group members and we had a discussion. And uh, Bill asked lots of very good questions. And it's amazing we've had the luck of having Bill Gates, who was willing to fund things that were very difficult to fund. And of course, tuberculosis, it's difficult to convince large pharma companies to do what we've done here, go through all this fragment-based discovery and get new molecules. So that's the story. We've been working not only on cancer, but on tuberculosis. I'm not going to talk any more about the leprosy or the cystic fibrosis, but I just wanted to say that we'd also been thinking about the drug resistance in uh, lung cancer, AIDS and HIV protease and in MTB. And um, the software skills that I got when I was in Dorothy's lab in the 1960s, I'd really realized were important, but I had always four or five people in my group who were writing software, sometimes more than that. And so the software that we've written uh, involves uh, using statistical methods, SDM, and you see as an Indian there, Aaron Prasad, um, who's actually going to rejoin my group um, this autumn as we move up to the medical school. But this is a statistical method. And then we also have used machine learning methods and um, uh, with a big database, which is important for learning. In this case, um, this is David Asher, who's now a professor in Australia. Douglas Pires, who went back to be a professor in Brazil, but then went and uh, joined David Asher. And here we have machine learning methods uh, that were developed in my group, uh, but now are developed by these people who are independent professors in uh, and around the world. And so this is the way we could uh, understand resistance mutations and uh, begin to avoid them in drug discovery. Uh, this is a case of recent work where we're doing that sort of thing with cryoEM. But just to finish, I, uh, of course, uh, left with uh, the question of how do we make uh, and design drugs against um, uh, these mutations, and especially for diseases of developing countries, uh, we can repurpose drugs, we can fragment them and regrow them, and we can have various kinds of other ideas of interfacial stabilizers. But there is a big challenge for all of this. Uh, for cancer, I can form a company and get a billion dollars. For HIV, um, it was also possible to get support. But in tuberculosis and things which affect the West less, it's much more difficult. And so much more needs to be done in our lab, in your labs, and so on. So that's my story. I have to thank members of my team. This is the CryoEM uh, team and students involved in working. And this is my present team. Um, and, and you can see uh, there my wife from Africa, who is now uh, retired but made major contributions. But you can see that my team still has Indians, Sandeep and Sherin and Arif and um, others um, in there, Pooja, she's just left. Asma has also just finished her PhD. So we have a, a lot of people internationally. It's gender balance, it's international. And I think that the best way to do science is to be gender balanced 
be multidisciplinary and to be international. So I'm sorry I've gone on so long, but that's my story. And um, I hope you can see that it's been for me a very enjoyable story of travel uh, from learning about insulin, uh, which was discovered 100 years ago, but joining 50 years ago, Dorothy Hodgkin's uh, laboratory generally, and then using her advice and experience and other ideas in both experimental and computational work to eventually make drug candidates. So I will stop speaking now and, and hope that I haven't confused you with the, uh, the diversity. Uh, but just to say, as you see, that I have depended on Indians and here you can see um, you can see uh, Siv Ramasash Session, Vijay and Sadhaminia um, and Srinivasan and uh, others, all from Indian uh, backgrounds. So thank you very much to all of you Indians who've helped my science. And I hope you've enjoyed my story. Thank you very much. It, is, uh, it was a very scintillating lecture. So now I request Sachin to take over related to the question answer section. So I request all students who just come out with the questions. If you have any to Professor Tom Blendel, he'll be very happy to answer your questions. And uh, over to Sachin. Thank you very much, ma'am. Answer some simple ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, they can raise their hands so I can unmute them or uh, they can even drop that in the chat box. Yes, actually your voice is very uh, trembling and there's something wrong with the machine, but so people speak slowly, yeah. Sir, I have one general question, general yeah. question. Uh, so uh, during the drug discovery program, like how you take care about the drug resistance, uh, which is going to be happening later? Sorry, I, I, your, your voice is very, very uh, okay. noisy. I don't okay. know what's going on with this. Okay, one. so uh, are you able to hear me now? Uh, yes, I can hear. Okay, Again. sir, uh, like during drug discovery, uh, related to the resistance, microbial resistance, what care you will be taking uh, uh, on the discovery of drugs? Sorry, I really just can't hear. Your voice is very... Okay, not I'll type, I'll type. type. Can, uh, can somebody ask, repeat the question? Sachin, can you do that? Yeah, yeah. She's asking how the resistance is addressed during drug discovery the microbial resistance, how that is addressed during drug discovery. How is drug discovery addressed? How is the resistance addressed? Oh, the resistance addressed. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, your voice is a very, uh, very shaky. Um, it's a system. Yes, so what I do is um, I, I look to see which areas in the protein um, structure are absolutely conserved and critical to the function. So, um, of course, the resistance can only occur if the organism can survive. So, if if, um, if I make my drug uh, target an area which is absolutely critical, uh, and um, uh, then I can begin to think of creating something that will be uh, difficult for the bug to uh, become resistant and still live. So that's my philosophy. So I try to understand the importance of re various residues and target ones that where resistance mutations uh, will not occur. That's my general philosophy. Very difficult. Okay. Thank you.
Yes, I, I'm afraid it, your voices are very, very noisy, but if there are any more questions, I'd... Okay. So uh, there is a question by Subhash. He is asking, is there any relationship between HIV latency and drug residence? Resistance. H. HIV, HIV latency and drug resistance. L latency? Yeah. Um, I'm afraid not that I know of. I'm sorry, I can't. Actually, um, as you can see, my work on HIV was really done in the 1980s. And so I've, I'm less up to date with that area of resistance, although I did make a, a big analysis of the mutations. I, I haven't really been looking at it recently. So it may have, there may be some evidence now, but um, I, I think it's very easy to look at the structure, look at mutations and look at the other features and see how they correlate. So I have one question. Uh, recently, there has been a revolution in AI, the alpha fold, that is very much dominating uh, in the protein pr structure prediction. So how do you think this AI, machine learning, all these things uh, could replace the experimental tools? Or is it, uh, need, is it necessary for the balance between the experimental and the computational things we are doing? So it, it's clear that machine learning AI methods are very powerful. And um, it, certainly the AlphaFold uh, work on the whole of the human proteome and many other proteomes is impressive. I think um, what I don't know is um, how accurate they are. So my group is certainly going to have a look at some of the structures produced by these methods, because I've been using a lot of AI machine learning myself, so I want it to succeed. Um, I suspect that these simple globular structures will be quite good, but from my own experience of using machine learning, when you have multi-domain systems and ones that are both membrane and outside the membrane or inside the cell, um, then the relationships of the different components, domains and multi-component systems are not well predicted yet. But I think we need to, the problem is that the alpha fold calculations were done so quickly, uh, we need to go through and check uh, their, their predictions and, and just see then. But what I have no doubt about is we can use these methods more generally than just using it to define a globular structure. We should be able to look at multi-protein systems and, and of various kinds and so on. So it's a challenge. But it, uh, AI ML has been the big revolution uh, in computing and alongside the cryo EM in the experimental side. And um, it, this has been a remarkable period over the last decade as those two methods have developed very fast. And um, so if I look back at the last 50 years, there were a lot of things happening just as I came into the group uh, on structure definition uh, in Cambridge, for example. But I think that the major revolution since the 50s, 60s has been this AI ML revolution. So um, everybody ought to be aware of it and uh, see what they can uh, do to use it. I mean, I, I should say AI ML, it's very quick to write software. Almost all our software we write in a few, uh, uh, in a few days. Um, but the problem is the learning set. And um, so you have to spend a lot of time cleaning up the learning set. And I, I thought I'd done that five or I think over 500 structures 
to learn from uh, using AI ML. But if you think about it, and you're going to look at various features, um, which could have many different parameters in a protein structure, even with 500 observations, you're not going to have anything that's really learning properly. And I think these AI machine learning methods applied to complex uh, features of protein structure and function tend to uh, really uh, not learn effectively. There's not enough data. So I, I think uh, it's data quantity, but also data quality. So I think that's the challenge. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, my talk, you could hear it this time, I hope. <laughs> yes, sir. A week ago. So the, uh, there is one last more chance. Uh, if, if you have any questions, you can unmute or drop it in the chat box, or else we'll proceed with. Sir, I yeah. have a question. I have a question. Am I audible? Yeah. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so you told about uh, you uh, you are studying about the structure of uh, SARS COVID SARS structure. So, can you tell a little bit more about it? How uh, you know studying the structure will help us uh, no. with the pandemic which is going on now? I I can hear part of your question as usual. All your voices I, I, okay. are okay. very noisy. Can somebody try and? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is asking about the importance of understanding the structure of SARS-CoV-2. Oh, uh, yes. How that helps in overcoming this pandemic. I, yes, it's uh, certainly something we've all been trying. And uh, what I did a year ago was uh, to make a preliminary database of all the protein structures which we predicted. Of course, a lot more experiments have been going on in the last year, um, and we found even more genes, of course, uh, that we hadn't noticed earlier on. Um, so I think it, uh, we have a lot of data that we're using in uh, drug discovery uh, to target, um, uh, but it's really quite a complex system, I think, much more than many people have thought. So um, one of my group has, for example, looked at all surface proteins and looked for other ways that the um, SARS-CoV-2 could recognize human proteins and get access into the cell. And I, th I think there are quite a few targets there. So if you block one route, you may still have another route if you're blocking entry. Uh, so I think there's many challenges yet, but what we need to do is to do a proper and very detailed structure and function analysis of, of all the genes uh, and um, continue to work on it. And the problem is, of course, everybody expects a new drug uh, to be developed in a few weeks, um, but most drugs are going to take several years. So it's not going to be a solution that helps the crisis immediately. But maybe if we can find a general approach, then other infections that arise from related uh, viruses, this coronavirus, uh, we can very quickly develop things. So I think it's really a question now of um, identifying mutations and divergence that can occur and uh, areas where there's got to be conservation and working for the future. So this is a crisis over a year. Uh, I've not made any, I've made a lot of drugs, but <laughs> never under 10 years. <laughs> and that's a challenge. But it's an important thing for you to work on. <laughs> Yes. Anyway, everything's okay in Mysore. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's okay. 
there are few cases still going on about covid yes yeah how is there sir how is there the situation sorry we are safe uh, yes. situation there in uh, uk sorry sachin can you just uh, she is asking about the situation in uk uh, i can't uh, So COVID. Why? How how is the COVID situation there in your place? Ah uh, yes. Um, yeah. We've had uh, a couple of cases uh, in the university the parts that I'm in my college and uh, the department, but n- nothing um, uh, really terribly serious. Obviously, I'm in the older age group, and so uh, I've been. Um, Uh, I, I've been to my lab quite a lot, but I try to uh, keep it spaced out. And I've been doing most of my work from home. Um, and uh, this is one of the problems of this pandemic. I, I can yes. talk to all my research team almost any time in the week, and they're uh, they're in their homes quite a lot of the time, and I'm quite often at home. I hope this is not going to discourage. people going to the lab but at the moment we have a one in four occupancy in my lab and so um uh, all people in computational work are not allowed into the uh, lab they have to do it from the back from home and those uh, in experimental work have a one in four chance of going in the lab so we have the week divided into two and the lab divided into two so we have four sections really and very strict distancing rules so we've been very careful i guess you have as well <laughs> yeah thank you so let's hope that everybody gets better i'm looking forward to coming to india i should be in india now <laughs> i should um uh, i tried to go to india at the end of november but all my friends in the academy and elsewhere emailed me immediately and said tom don't come in november <laughs> so my next visit to india is going to be uh, at the moment in march uh, next year so i hope everything is uh, sorted and on both our sides and we can travel but anyway i very much enjoy being in india <laughs> yes can any of you play carnatic music yeah we have we have some students <laughs> you have colleagues yeah yeah students are there <laughs> good yes okay well uh, Is, is that it? Sanjana, carry on. Sanjana. I will just thank everybody. Uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, shall I some... leave or do you have anything else for me? But thank you very much for inviting me to give this. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry about the problems we had last week. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. So, so respected dignitaries and students, it gives me immense pleasure to extend heart, heartfelt thanks on behalf of the Department of Molecular Biology and Science Forum, your Rajas College, Mysore, and myself during this occasion. Uh, first and foremost, I thank our special guest, uh, Professor Sir Tom Blundell, Director of Research, uh, Emeritus Sir William Dunn, Professor of Biochemistry, Department of Biochemistry, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, for delivering a special talk on the topic, the centenary of insulin discovery, celebrating revolutionary developments in protein sequence, structure, and drug discovery. I extend my sincere gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor G. Hemant Kumar, for his continuous support. I also extend our gratitude to our beloved principal, uh, Professor Eskoda, your Rajas College, Mysuru, uh, for her support for arranging this webinar. Uh, I also thank all the faculties, uh, research scholars, students, Uh, for their presence, and also Professor Devrajay Gowda, Administrative Officer and Controller of Examination for their support. I thank our uh, University of Mysore, uh, the technical staff, uh, for providing all the necessary facilities for this program, and also arranging live streaming of the program, uh, which has happened simultaneously uh, during uh, this event. 
and i must thank the organizing team the volunteers participants for their active participation and i also take this opportunity to remind ourselves of the covid appropriate behavior and help us overcome the pandemic at the earliest possible time uh, please get vaccinated if you have not uh, maintain social distance and wear a face mask and only leave home uh, when necessary uh, so thank you once again uh, i thank all of you uh, for joining us today and for your time thank you okay thank you thank you thank you thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much for everything and see you all thank you thank you sir thank you. we hope to see you see you see you sir see you Yeah, today, today we went on uh, so well. Uh, only thing uh, I should have had uh, that mic, na. <laughs> no, ma'am, it's not. Maybe it's just the. Uh, uh, I mean, slowly we have to talk. To <laughs> My voice is not audible. I think, na. It, it's audible. Ma. It's audible. audible. The, there was bit uh, network issue. From network this issue. Maybe, okay, maybe. okay. I thought I should have had that uh, earphone, na. No? That would have been better, alla. <laughs> Uh, if Milan is there, I think uh, we need to stop the recording and the live stream. Ah, it's still yeah. going on. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Call Marad. Uh, I think he is here, ma'am. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Asked, ma'am. Ah, asked, asked. I thank. So okay. stop, ma'am. Buddy, live streaming the matter. Oh, recording. Okay.